Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webinar, Remodeling Done Right uh, from Fun Home Building. Before I get into introductions, I'd like to thank uh, Loctite PL Max for sponsoring this uh, presentation tonight. Uh, you know, our, our sponsors are uh, play a big part in us being able to bring content like this to you. So uh, thank you to them. And of course, uh, thank you to Travis Brungart and Joe Cook from uh, Catalyst Construction for being our, our, our presenters here tonight. Um, welcome, guys. Thank you. So um, I didn't in I didn't prepare uh, a little bio for you guys because I know you guys wanted to talk a little bit about your own experience in remodeling. Um, the, 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 the gist of tonight's presentation is about uh, best practices for sort of getting from the beginning to the end of a remodeling project. Um, can you guys tell me a little bit about your, your background and uh, go ahead, Travis. Go for it, Joe. Oh, Joe. Yeah, uh, my name is Joe Cook. I'm co-owner of Catalyst Construction. Um, Travis and I have been running Catalyst for about 15 years now. Uh, I started in construction when I was like 22 years old painting uh, summers while I was going to uh, junior college and that just kind of evolved into working in a remodeling crew, uh, project management for a new home builder and uh, when Travis and I formed Catalyst, uh, I'll let him talk about his licenses but through that process I Got my general contractor's license and a master plumber's license. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, as Joe said, I'm Travis Brungart, co-owner of Catalyst Construction. We we definitely are a, a custom home builder specializing in high performance uh, new homes, but we've been primarily a remodeling firm for the majority of our careers, uh, you know, just by volume, one or two custom homes a year, and then 12 remodeling projects. So for every one home that we complete, we're doing another 10 renovations. And so uh, that experience has led to a lot of uh, wisdom is what you call it when you when things don't go quite the way you want it and you have to fix it. Uh, but also we have a lot of successes, so uh, I won't downplay those. I will say that Joe's point about uh, our licenses uh, is certainly uh, pertinent to the conversation because through those years of, of kind of coming up in the trades, uh, and I did, I started out. Uh, remodeling after high school, doing all manner of things because it was a very small crew. We self-performed the majority of our work. I had the good fortune of working with somebody who had done a wide variety of things. So he was comfortable uh, replacing a furnace or hanging wallpaper or, you know, laying up block or roofing. He was a framer by trade before he broke his back. And he knew everything, a little bit about everything. So that was the way that I got into the trades. And that, I think, certainly shaped my path going forward because uh, the ability to self-perform work has been incredibly important to us in order to stay on schedule and maintain quality. And so, as Joe said, when he pursued the, the plumbing license, I pursued my electrical, or no, my HVAC license, uh, master mechanical license. And then when Joe picked up the, the general contractor's license so we could continue to pull permits uh, as a general, I picked up the electrical, which was my focus prior to beginning as a renovator. So that's that's kind of who we are and, and why we would like to think that we have something to offer our viewers on uh, on remodeling done right. Yeah, and just jump in there. I think, Travis, uh, for the first five years, you and I were the company and right. we did everything in-house. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a, a lot to be said for hiring the right people, but sometimes we are the right people. The idea of having trusted subcontractors uh, that you work with as your partners is incredibly important uh, because you can't do everything when you get to a certain scale, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to jump way ahead, but when we, when we talk about renovation, a lot of times for us, that means uh, additions, roof off, add a whole story, basement finishes and things that are within the envelope are uh, a, a little less time sensitive. But if you tear the roof off of someone's house and you say, me and my buddy Joe are going to frame this, we'll get it buttoned up for you in no time. That exudes a different level of panic than, Hey, here are the nine guys that are going to get this roof back on in the next two to, two to three days. Uh, people are just going to be a lot safer with their assembly open for a uh, shorter amount of time and more people allow for that to happen. So over the years, Joe and I have added several people to our company. Uh, James Quentin and Brent uh, are, well, they're not working on anything now. It's too late in the day for them. But generally speaking, 
uh, that is our in-house team. Uh, and we, we do still self-perform the majority of our interior renovations. But as soon as we open things up, we're not running excavators. We're not pouring concrete and we're not generally framing and roofing. So we do still work with subcontractors. And that's part of this discussion too, because setting expectations, which is kind of what we were going to start with from our client's perspective, that has to be done with your subcontractors as well. Okay. Before we get started, I just want to remind everybody, uh, we do have a QA and a uh, box in the Zoom app here. So I, I can't remember if we decided we were going to try to wait to the end for the questions. It probably would trip us up a little bit too much, right, to, to, to address them during the middle. So I'll, I'll try to keep an eye on them and, and make note of some good questions and uh, and we'll save them for probably about a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. And um, I also wanted to mention, uh, I noticed a lot of people in the comments already are telling where they're where they're uh, watching from. Uh, it's always a great idea for people to tell us not only where you're from, but what kind of work you do, because it helps us, you know, get a get a feel for what topics to cover now and in, and in the future. So uh, feel free to tell us that in the in the comments. And so put in your questions throughout the presentation, but we'll, we'll be saving them for the end. Uh, for a Q and A section, and uh, uh, Travis and Joe were kind enough to send me a bunch of photos, and I did my best to put them in a slideshow for them. And I was having a little bit of technical glitches, so uh, bear with us, and please let us know if you're having any trouble seeing them once I get them up on the screen here. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and share screens here and get the slideshow going if I can. And Rob, you did the yeoman's work here because I sent you a bunch of photos from uh, the stuff that Joe and I have been working on over the years. But in the transfer of the files, all of the labels for the photos uh, <laughs> defaulted to just numbers. So there was really no guidance. It was just, well, Rob will look at this picture and he'll see that it's a picture of zip <laughs> wall uh, and plastic. So hopefully he'll just drop that in in the perfect place. Uh, so, uh, if you think the photos don't make a ton of sense, don't blame Rob. That's a, that's a, a technical glitch that I'll, I'll share the blame for. All right. Well, we're moving on to your first, uh, topic here, managing client expectations. Perfect. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in on this, Joe, but definitely, uh, don't hesitate to interrupt. I think that one of the most important things that we do in any project to set ourselves up for success is to manage the client's expectations before we even begin. Uh, and if you're like us, you do a, a fair amount of renovation work that doesn't necessarily involve uh, fully developed architectural and structural drawings. A lot of times we're called to a, a residence for a client's wish to have a, a larger kitchen, um, you know, a, a larger master suite or primary suite is what we're calling it now. The idea of somebody wanting us to sort of develop the design and perform the work is very common. And I think that's common throughout our industry. So what we what we have to begin in that very first meeting with is understanding the goals from the, the client's perspective and then us setting the expectations of what we intend to execute. So we are defining the scope of work and then seeking their feedback to establish whether or not we have adequately kind of retold the story that they've told us so that we can be sure we're on the same page. Uh, and there's a lot of great resources uh, in fine home building issues past other webinars. Like I know Jake Bruton shared a lot of uh, his, you know, client expect or managing client expectations. But for, for what we do, uh, what you're looking at here, these are some images from projects that we have, uh, we have completed. I think the previous image was uh, a house that I designed the third floor for. And then this is a kitchen that we recently built. And these, these clients basically came to us with, we want more space for our family. And that's a pretty low bar to clear. You can, you can build on an addition. You can maybe knock down a wall between two rooms and combine some spaces. But the, the very first thing that we do after we establish the common ground uh, between this is what the client's asking us for and this is what we want to deliver, hopefully those are the same things, then we start talking about how awful the experience is going to be. <laughs> is that fair, Joe? Is that how you would say we, <laughs> we set the Yeah, down? I'd say when we meet with them, we discuss like sometimes if it's a big enough scope of work, we will ask them are you going to move out for this project? And majority of the time, the answer is no. So then we we talk about using air scrubbers and setting up our zip walls and floor protection. But we emphasize that, look, this will be stressful on your house. If you have kids, you're losing the space where you're going to do all your cooking. And so we need to relocate that or you're going to have to make arrangements 
to, you know, you know, maybe a hot plate in the basement or a microwave, we can sometimes move the fridge into another space. But we set expectations early because we, we know it's going to be in a, uh, not the best experience for them from start to finish. The end of result, they're always happy with. But yeah, we kind of set expectations early in just our initial meeting. And side note, Travis and I go to all our client meetings. Um, we have both owners go there. It helps because, you know, one of us can be taking notes and measurements while the other one's engaging with the client and it kind of gives them what, you know, a catalyst experience. Um, and then when we actually present a proposal to them, we do it in a scope of work fashion. So you can always refer to our proposal as our scope of work. So it starts with, you know, permits, disposal, dust control measures, you know, and then demo. And so they, you know, if they're wondering what the next phase is, they can just refer to the scope of work. Yeah, it's a very unified, uh, or the intent is that we provide a very uh, clear and linear description of what we're going to accomplish so that that reference point is always there for them and referring back to it frequently. Uh, the way that we would refer back to the contract on a new home is certainly what we find to be the, the cleanest and easiest way to keep everyone tracking on the same path. Um, the next yeah. thing that we do, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to jump in real quick. Um, yeah, sometimes like we'll do a, Travis and I will put together a kitchen proposal and it might be 22 line items and it's very detailed. Uh, you know, some people have said it's overly detailed, but for us, it serves many functions. Uh, it's a scope of work for the client. They have all their allowances in there. We can then take that and give it to our guys. So then they also have the scope of work and everyone's on the same page. I think the last thing that we try to do after establishing the, the expectation of this will be the pain points, it will be dust that even though best efforts will be made, it will find its way to other parts of the house. Even though we will work during normal business hours, your life will be disrupted. You will be unhappy with the, the noise when you wanted to have a nice quiet lunch uh, at home one day or you know catch up on a podcast. You will be irritated by the compressor and the pounding. All those things that we do to talk about how unpleasant it can be the stress for your pets, the, you know, the stress on uh, your schedule. Then we try to move on to, this is what you have control over and you have a role in this too. And unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, I guess if you're looking at it in a bottom line way, fortunately for us, uh, clients tend to want us to do more things than what they originally planned once we get started. And I'm sure every renovation contractor has the same experience. You've agreed to the scope. You, you're going to move forward and start the job. What always happens is, hey, while you're here, uh, can you also do the hall bath? Uh, if you're going to have the the plumbing off anyway, Joe is the master plumber. Can he please replace the dripping main valve? Because uh, we've had a bucket under it for the last six years, and it never really fills up. But it would be nice if you would just take care of that while you're here. And we say, absolutely. It's always easier for us to add it to the scope and the schedule before we start. That makes that uh, easier to maintain the timeline. Uh, but frequently that does not play out. It is almost always, oh gosh, you know, we're this deep into the project and you've already got a painter here. Let's just do the whole first floor. And obviously that's a great path to revenue uh, and, and certainly good customer service to take care of your client. But we always have to emphasize everything you add to the scope adds to the schedule. And those delays are not our delays. They are your delays. So we're working on it together. It, it can be problematic if they want to add work, but not add to time uh, in, in terms of expectations. So we would encourage anyone uh, engaging in this type of work to, to certainly set those expectations early on and then remind the clients of their role in the progress of the project, timely selections, uh, you know, certainly allowable work hours, all those things. And as Joe said, moving out allows us to not spend an extra two and a half hours cleaning the path to work every day. We can reduce that to a, a 30 to 45 minute pickup where essentially materials can be left out and certain things can be left not operational. But we'll get more into that uh, in the next section. So, so quickly, do, do you guys um, explicitly have that conversation uh, that you ex 
telling the clients you expect them to want changes during the during the process like there's there's sort of like a, a process laid out for that certainly it's a symbiosis uh in, in terms of we want it's a customer service industry that we're in you know the the whole reason that we're brought up to the job is to make something that isn't performing the way they want or doesn't solve their aesthetic desire we want to get it to that level and so if there's if there's a potential for a change during the project to occur but that's going to result in a better outcome of them getting what they want that's kind of what we're here for we we need to we need to be open to that however we have to always remind them the change that you make isn't just a change it's a budget change it's a schedule change and it it may have potential schedule impacts on our side that will potentially be prohibitive you know if you wanted to revise something so substantially that we were going to delay at the start on another project that's something that is more uh more discussion than just okay we'll do that because it's a customer service industry and we want to make you happy we have to still serve our other clients that we have commitments to and so we want to make sure that that's clearly laid out at the beginning you want to take this to get us going joe on the site prep how do we get a job ready for us to start work well, and this was a good one. Uh, this client did move out. We were doing her kitchen as well as her lower level basement. Um, but you can see we bought a lot of red rosin. Uh, most of this area is all foot traffic. So, uh, and we also kind of double dutied with our red rosin and tape is all this was getting painted. So we decided that we would go ahead and paint tape it off like our painter would. So when the painter comes back or at the end of the project, it's pretty much prepped to go. Um, and so we specifically told our guys not to get the tape onto the trim that we were taping it off as we were going to prep it for spraying. Um, and this is pretty typical of most of our projects. We're going to come in, we're going to set up our zip poles. Travis and I, uh, we, Definitely never set out to own 20 pairs of zip poles, but it's kind of evolved to that over, over the last few years. Um, and we just hit everything. We try to, you know, a lot of this is you're showing your customer that you care. Um, and then, like Travis said, the dust is going to make its way through. It always does. But you've done everything that you can to, like, reduce it as much as possible. So what's not shown in this picture is, uh, we have a bedroom in like an office area. We went ahead and covered everything in the house. So her bed was covered with plastic, her desk, her dressers, uh, closet doors were taped off. And then even though that we're not working in that room, then we would do the zip pull at the opening and really try to isolate our workspace from the rest of the house. Uh, it is more challenging when the client is living there um, and you just kind of have to, you know, sometimes we'll put in a zip door um, and we'll repair it 20 times throughout the project because it gets ran through by the dog or the kid or the client or us. Um, but it's part of something you need as a contractor to kind of factor that into your job. Because so I believe that one of the reasons Travis and I, we, we really have never advertised and we have a pretty good reputation is we go the extra mile. We vacuum up every day. We do the site prep and we try to be very tidy on our projects. And that that's really what this photo is showing because if this was an area that we were going to be developing dust in for, you know, from sanding or uh, demolition operations, uh, this would be, you know, tape sealed to the wall. We mm -hmm. would do a, a zip door and a more substantial um, method of, of isolation. This is the level of dust protection that we feel is necessary if we're going to be passing through like you can see that there are cabinet hinges on the counter there there are cabinet doors on the floor this is a, a one day demo of removing cabinets from the walls so this is the level of dust um dust migration prevention that we feel is appropriate for that and then it still enables the client to you know pull it aside and move furniture in and out and do the things that they want to do uh without us risking the damage to the walls that sometimes occurs when you do extended taping and sealing um Obviously, we're, we're also managing dust in other ways. This is uh, our typical carry in and get started kit uh, of a shop vac for the dust management that Joe was talking about of cleaning up after ourselves. But more importantly, um, negative air machines, air scrubbers. Uh, this, is, this is the one that we have. This company, I don't believe, is in business anymore. 
but uh, Husqvarna makes a really nice kit. Dry Ease is another one. Um, there are really good air scrubbers available that can run continuously on a job and literally just pull the ambient air through that filter media that you see on the face of that uh, and, and trap it, capture it in that location. You can actually hook a discharge hose up to run a higher volume of air and exhaust. And that's what we would consider a negative air situation where we're actually depressurizing the work site. So once we've taped off and with plastic and sealed our workspace, uh, we want to make sure that the the dust that we're creating isn't in a pressurized situation. You know, you see some guys with a window open and a box fan in it. If you pressurize the job, you're actually forcing that dust out through your dust control measures into the rest of the house. What we want to do is depressurize our workspace so we pull air into the air scrubber and exhaust it through that hose to an outdoor space after it's been filtered. So we're not dumping the dust out. We're capturing the dust on the filter media. Uh, there's a HEPA filter inside of that pre-filter that you can see in the image there. But that is our, our primary means of dust control after we have sealed everything off. The other thing that we want to talk about is protection of mechanicals. Um, I don't think I included a picture for you, Rob, in terms of uh, providing coverage for returns, which we always are going to have to do. But this is a new mini split. This project was a, an interior renovation where we added several mini splits to second floor bedrooms. And so you can see we've exposed uh, the work area that we needed in the wall, pulled the line set up, insulated, and we're ready to begin our drywall patching. But before we even begin installing drywall, we do not want to introduce dust into our new product. This is a situation where the client has paid us good money to provide really good equipment. And if the first thing that you do after installing new trims, uh, new cabinets, new countertops, or new equipment is promptly booger it up by running something into that freshly painted cabinet or introducing dust into a sensitive piece of equipment uh, like a ductless mini split, you really are going to have a hard time winning that client back over because they're, they're going to be very frustrated that you've misspent their funds. So this was obviously just a, a quick cover this thing up uh, and seal it off for dust that will fall. Uh, if, if, if we were spraying in this area, painting, for example, or if the equipment is going to be operating, we would have had to seal that up perfectly. The, the bottom corners couldn't be uh, bunched up that way, which you can't really see the tape running at a diagonal and sealing that off. There's extra plastic there that hangs over that. But that is our intent is to protect the items that the client is paying us to install uh, just as much as we're protecting the rest of the house. And since we glossed over it a little bit earlier, I'll, I'll revisit it before I talk about the foam door. We, we view uh, floor protection as three potential outcomes. We're either going to do what Joe talked about earlier with the red rosin and tape, that is essentially a light traffic condition where we're not doing uh, demolition of plaster on a ceiling or setting a beam or we're going to be rolling a beam lift in. That is a, hey, we're walking in and out of this space and we don't want to risk tracking dust, uh, drywall mud paint across a finished floor. That is a light duty protection. We also have done projects where we've brought in a uh, quarter inch hardboard and covered the entire floor as if we were sheathing floors because we are going to have, you know, 80 pounds of plaster per square foot <laughs> dropping on it in <laughs> unscheduled ways because of previous projects where dump, demo was left in the ceiling and things of that nature, where we have to do impact protection. We're going to bring in hardboard. I know guys that do uh, quarter inch drywall and then the hardboard on top of that for really severe impact protection. Uh, particularly over tile, which is generally going to be less resilient than hardwoods. We tend to have a lot of hardwood floors uh, in, in the common areas that we're protecting. But those are the, the levels of floor protection that we really spend a lot of time uh, doing. Occasionally, if we're working over carpet, we'll, we'll do the peel and stick runner. Uh, but those have a short life. So you got to be mindful of how long you have before you have to roll those things up so the adhesive doesn't transfer to the carpet permanently. So and uh, do you guys seal the seams on the hardboard? We you tape do the seams on the uh, with tape, yes. Yeah. Typically just masking tape. Uh, when we use RAM board, which is kind of the in-between, I guess I, I glossed over that one. RAM board is just like a heavier duty uh, red rosin. It's cardboard, basically. So it has much better moisture protection uh, for, I would say, very light impact protection. Uh, but if, if we're talking about you know a tile setter that's going to be working in a space, they're going to saturate that red rosin in the first few minutes and it's going to become uh, 
sensitive and will tear underfoot. Ram board's more durable for that application. And even with a tile setter, we would typically put down a tarp to handle moisture. Uh, but all those, all those products, we would typically tape around the entire perimeter of the space with just a, a blue masking tape, something that is uh, medium adhesion, not a high adhesion tape, uh, but something that isn't going to damage the floors. And then we would lay out our product and then tape from tape to tape, excuse me, from product to tape so that we're not using like a ram board tape on a hardwood floor because it would damage that surface. Um, go yeah, ahead, go. And even, uh, you know, part of our process will protect the floors if we're not touching them at all. They're just staying existing. Um, obviously, we'll pay really good attention to it, but we'll also protect our floors even if they're scheduled to be refinished because we want to avoid any additional damage like even scratches, dents, you'll go back to refinish the floor and there's the problem areas that we just don't want to, you know, we're not really wanting to deliver that to our clients. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch on is, uh, and this is something Travis has always been really big on, is when we're in someone's house, we'll get media filters and we will go ahead and tape those to all the cold air returns and we change the furnace filters on a regular basis. There's the picture right there um, because, you know, with some equipment, they're paying us good money to install it, but also we don't want to ever have a conversation with a client like, Hey, I just had this furnace replaced five years ago and it cost me $15,000 and you're running dirt through it. So for the maybe $50 worth of furnace filters we'll buy on a project, it's worth every penny. 100%. Uh, yeah, I know, guys. It's like we, even if you're doing something for a short amount of time in a room, it's it it seems like a big effort to to take those extra steps. But uh, it, you just you just got to do it no matter how how short you're going to be in there, right? Yeah. Anything that's going to create an airborne dust, it's best practice to shut off the if you use, <laughs> if you have a forced air uh, furnace air handler. If you shut that thing off, it's not going to be drawing in. Uh, so then your, your source control becomes much easier uh, rather than going through the house and, you know, covering all your cold air returns and, you know, running the air scrubber and all that. If, if it's a, hey, I'm going to cut out this section of drywall in here and we're going to access the shower valve on the backside of the, the wall and then replace it, much easier to do a, a quick, let's shut this off, run a shop vac while we're making the cut. And then once the dust is mitigated, then we can turn the system back on for the homeowner. Um, this is uh, This is one of my favorite tips and tricks. Uh, you can see we've removed the floor protection in this area because obviously we had to move on to trim and we wanted to get the base and casings right down onto the hardwoods. But this uh, is my favorite application for rigid foam. We make temporary foam doors for our primary means of access uh, because it's easy for the homeowner to operate. It's also very easy for us to make them seal very well. You could basically make a masking tape hinge. Uh, what I usually do is a, a masking tape around the contact points for a, a gorilla tape or a heavier duty tape that will act as the hinge. And then it's just a piece of tape for a handle, just like guys would typically do on new cabinet doors. Before you put the hardware on, you make the little folded over piece of tape and that's your handle. Um, these foam doors are one of the best investments you can do on a project because you can rely on that friction fit to provide really maybe 95% is optimistic, but at least 90% uh, of, a, of an air seal because you're, you're literally cutting to friction fit on all four sides of the door. And as long as no one breaks it, which you can see in the top corner of that one, uh, I maybe cut it a little too short and it looks like we broke that little corner off. Uh, but it's so easy for the homeowner to operate that, that they, they experience your level of protection on that daily basis where they're, they're wanting to see the job. They want to come in. We've not had as good success with uh, zip doors. The old zipper doors are more finicky than the magnetic ones. We haven't used the magnetic ones very much. They're much nicer and easier for the clients to operate. The uh, the zipper ones, you almost need to like stand on the floor, you know, on the lower section before you operate the zipper. And our clients have never liked those, but they really like the foam door because it operates just like a door and it's one-handed and you don't have to fuss with it going up and down with the zipper. So that is something that I think is like a legit tip and trick. It, it's a, you know, an extra 30 minutes to make a door and once it's all masked in and done well, we typically don't have to replace them for the duration of the project. Um, I mean, I'm no Doug Horgan, but that is something that I like to think uh, I, I've, I've provided a good thing for our clients. 
you want to talk through what Doug's doing here, Joe? This is pretty pretty good stuff if you're going to protect a, a stair and railing. Yeah, he's uh, very nicely done there, Doug. Um, it looks like he's protecting the handrail, and he has the a runner on the staircase. Uh, I personally haven't used that one before, but um, I'd be willing to. It looks like he's doing a great job there. and But it's really, I think, just the overall, what I'm getting from the pitcher is, this is what the client wants to see. They want to see someone taking the time. Um, and what you don't want to do as the contractor is not don't factor. If you don't factor it in, then it becomes like, Oh boy, I'm going to spend $300 on protection and then a half day putting it in, just build that into your project. And then you can take the time, do it right. It'll last the entire project. And it just kind of starts off to Travis's point earlier it's kind of a miserable experience living through a remodel. So you're showing them the, you know, the very first or second day that you are taking the time to make their experience better. Yeah, this is an excellent article. If, if you guys haven't read this, go back into the fine home building website, the, the archive, the digital arch archive is very easily searchable. I know you put a ton of time into making that happen, Rob. So we, we utilize that resource all the time, but Doug's article on site protection is fantastic. It includes all these, great products like i think this is protective products they're a cono runner uh and then doug's just using sill sealer to protect the yeah. top edge of the wainscot uh that little bit of padding gives you that impact protection and then you're also sealing it out with the tape sealing the dust out with tape so showing that level of care to your client is a huge part of a successful project but don't forget that you're showing it to your subcontractors too ah. if you let them into the job and act like it's no big deal we own the place just walk around and do what you like you will get that level of performance from them. Whereas if you show them, hey, this is protected, my expectation is that we will not damage this surface. Look how much time I spent committing to protection of this space. Your job is to maintain that level of protection as well. That is a, an environment, a company culture, a, a job site environment that is self-sustaining to a certain point. We always talk about it with trash. If you set down some trash in the corner, you have made that corner the trash corner. If you have receptacles and, you know, all the lunch trash is in the garage, it's not allowed in the house. All those things really are self-sustaining. Once you develop that culture on site, it's very easy to maintain and it's almost impossible to break a bad habit once you allow it. Yep. And Doug, Doug pointed out in the comments that his coworker, Tom Johnston, should get credit for a lot of the uh, creative solutions for protection in that article. So it's a really great piece. Uh, I think our next steps were about safety uh, in our selective demolition process. We, we do a fair amount of uh, reuse on older projects because uh, we're always trying to reduce our footprint. I think everyone is you know, doing their part, or I hope everyone's doing their part uh, to recycle materials that can be reused. Certainly we've uh, done a, a lot of runs to Habitat Restore over the years. This is our crew, James and Quentin, removing cabinets on a project that uh, found their way to a new, uh, a new home uh, that allowed for them to be reused because sometimes the stuff that isn't good enough for somebody is a huge upgrade for someone else. I have some really nice cherry cabinets in my garage that came out of a job we did about 25 years ago <laughs> that uh, don't belong in a garage, but I couldn't bear to see them go. That's exactly what we're doing here. We're trying to minimize what we put in the landfill by doing some careful removal, there are a lot of things in most projects that can be reused even on the same project. If we're not talking about donating appliances and tops and cabinets to Habitat, we, we are definitely frequently tasked with, hey, we've got to match this trim because you know, you're renovating this space, but we don't want to make a departure. And this is something that they haven't made planer knives for for you know, 70 or 80 years. Uh, we can get them made, but why spend $100 on a custom knife when you can just do a careful job of removing the base or crown molding, removing the nails immediately after you demo, you know, you, obviously you're going to cut the caulking joint. And as you carefully pull it from the wall, uh, you can then go ahead and remove the nails, label it uh, and bundle it with other like crowns nested together, place it in the garage or the basement or somewhere on site where it won't be in the traffic pattern, protect it for reuse. And you really, um, you're doing the right thing for obviously the planet, but for your client, because if they care about it and they want it to be the same, you again can show that care and, and limit the amount of, uh, 
time you waste trying to source materials that you've already got. Uh, that's true with with structural elements too. We've taken out, um, you know, common project, redo the whole first floor of the house. We want to open up the kitchen, remove a bunch of walls, saving materials from projects that are frankly uh, a higher quality lumber than what we can get at the store today. Uh, it just makes good sense. We had a project where we uh, we basically gutted the whole first floor and I saved all these two by 10 headers because, you know, that's what you do. You use a two by 10, whatever the opening is. It's a two by 10 header, regardless of the span, regardless of the structure. Of course, we know that to not be the case, but there's no reason to go throw the two by tens, the labor of those headers into the dumpster and then labor again to go to the store and get more two by 10 for headers. We just cut them down and allocated them to the proper places on the job site. You want to jump in on that, Joe? Yeah, I was going to just make a little side note, and I'm sure every other contractor on this can agree, is Travis and I both have garages full of material that we use. Just this week, Travis ran to his house and grabbed a one by 4 for a project that we were doing down the street. Uh, we didn't anticipate needing one, and uh, he's like, well, I'll just hop in here and grab it real quick. Um, but yeah. And another thing we do, and this could just be, I don't know if it's something I'd recommend for everybody, but at least be, you know, aware of it is we try really hard to recycle all our cardboard. Um, you know, it drives me bananas when I'll be driving down the street and I'll see a dumpster just full of appliance boxes. So we'll actually take the time, separate them all out, break them down, and usually send one of our guys to the recycling center that he can then put them all in their right bins. And uh, that's just something that makes us feel good. Um, just trying to reduce waste overall. Um, typically on the finish side, uh, we yeah. run into more of the cardboard, but definitely is part of the whole sustainability vision of the company. Yeah, and this one here, um, I mean, it's we're demoing. And so when we get into demo, we have guidelines for our crew or if Travis and I are doing it, is you label all your wires. You cap the plumbing and try to just cap it all at once and let the homeowner know, especially if they're home, uh, say, hey, uh, at 1230, I'm going to turn off the water. It's going to be for about two hours. And then at 330, we're going to have it back on. And, you know, we try not to dictate those hours to them. It's more of a question. Hey, will this work with your schedule? And then also label the water line sometimes because not hot isn't always on the left when it's in the wall. Um, and that just helps on the back end when you're trying to put stuff back together You can say, oh, well, this wire here used to, uh, do the hallway light, but now that's gone. So now we need to chase it back and just eliminate it or tie it in somewhere else. But if you don't do those steps, you can spend a lot of time on the back end solving problems that you could have just solved with a Sharpie in five minutes. 100%. That's a, a great image to show the labeling of the, the wiring, but also something that everyone can relate to uh, who's done any renovation work is the gifts from the previous renovation. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is obviously a bunch of drywall scrap that the, the previous guys were like, well, I'm not taking this to the dumpster. I'm just going to slide these back behind this water line and we'll sheet right over it. So uh, that goes back to <laughs> planning your jobs appropriately. You know that your dumpster is going to get a little bit fuller than you planned because there will be things that are not clear uh, and if you happen to be oversized on your on your dumpster plan there's almost always some basement cleaning out uh, in our market that the client's like hey can I go ahead and throw in this Christmas tree I didn't want to use the old plastic one we're going to get a new one there's always that stuff but of course the uh, the giant stack of dust <laughs> in the bottom corners is just a uh, something to enjoy for everyone who's done any renovation work you've seen this I'm sure if it wasn't drywall scraps it was probably plaster or uh, the occasional beer cans and pack of cools from 1952 sitting down in there with the uh, years of dust and, and disgusting benefits to our job, right? Yeah. So in terms of the MEP connections, Joe, what's the best time to, uh, to start a plumbing project? Well, in the morning. So we have a rule. <laughs> you don't start, you don't like start making your connections at three o'clock in the afternoon. And this is more a rule for our crew. Um, you know, obviously if you, if I'm doing it, um, and I trust our crew, but it's just a, a catalyst like outline more or less, you don't start them at three o'clock. You definitely don't do them at three o'clock on a Friday. 
So we try to do everything first thing in the morning. Um, and if, you know, it's like we get there at eight o'clock, like maybe nine 30, make sure the clients is out of the house. So we're not turning off the water while they're trying to get ready for work. But yeah, it's in case something goes wrong, then we don't want to be having to stay late or come in on a Saturday and even kind of, uh, you know, disrupt their life a little bit more. We've, uh, we've had our share of surprises in addition to, of course, the crummy crumbs in the wall that you, you find or the eight layers of plaster that were left in the ceiling before uh, the previous guys finished upstairs. We've also found mechanicals running in places that they never should have been. Uh, the old gas lines that served, you know, before, electric, before electrification for lighting, there was obviously uh, gas lines run to fixture locations. And those had been converted to chases. So you, you've basically got a mudded in uh, or plastered in gas line that now is carrying current uh, because they've fished wires through it and it's just been mudded into the plaster and you hit those when you're doing demo. That's always a negative surprise. Uh, we've had crown molding that we were cutting out to you know bring some custom cabinets in. And as you're just using that oscillating tool to slice out that section of crown that you need, you hit the wires that they fished in behind it instead of running them through the walls. So those kinds of things are unpleasant surprises that you need to be ready for. And you just don't want to do that at the end of the day. Um, well, and if you do do it, you then you're staying late to get it done. Um, it's real big with us is, hey, if you delete a circuit, make sure that you've accounted for everything that was on that circuit, like check the refrigerator, check their microwave. Uh, you know, we're not perfect. Travis and I have both received the call at 6 p.m. when the client's like, hey, uh, our refrigerator isn't working. And then we're running over there with an extension cord. So you can never outguess it all, but it's really good to have these policies in place. So the crews that are on site can, you know, you're trying to present them for success. This was a fun one. <laughs> yeah, this is temporary connections. Like you saw the shark bites on the end of the copper lines in the previous image and the labeling on the electrical lines. And um, obviously it's pretty easy to wire nut a couple of uh, conductors back together to keep something connected. But this was actually noteworthy because it was our client who was like, yeah, the, the upstairs bedroom, my daughter's bedroom is, uh, it, it's not getting to get any heat while we're reallocating the duct work. But I have this flex from my work. Can I can I use this flex to connect up? It's like absolutely. This is great because we would have to get, you know, <laughs> some eight inch flex or run a couple of uh, <laughs> six inch flex lines. And he had this uh, this poly line that was basically super durable flex duct for supplying air to uh, workers in in uh, confined spaces below grade. You know, manhole. I think he worked for AT and T or, or Southwestern Bell, one of the the Bell companies. And this is a this is a supply hose for providing fresh air to a worker in a confined space, but he had it on the truck and he's like, can you connect this up to get the cold air to my daughter's room? It's like, yes, this is perfect. This is way better than what we would have with a piece of foil that the first time somebody walks by with a board and catches the edge of it, it's going to tear open. So uh, there are solutions available, but you need to be thoughtful because as soon as your client has to listen to a complaint from their child about how they couldn't get any rest because their room was hot, because we're dumping all the nice cold conditioned air into the workspace, uh, you will want to rapidly revise your, your plans and uh, correct that situation. Um, before we do structural, one more note on uh, temporary MEP. I wanted Joe to mention the dangers of recharging plumbing lines because of the migration of whatever is loose in the lines. You remember at Routabush, Joe, when uh, you oh. ended up basically replumbing their upstairs bathroom? Uh, as a function of the calcium deposits floating around and all finding their way to the top valve. Prepare yeah, for that, right. We uh, we were doing a basement finish and the existing copper plumbing was in really bad shape. And it didn't really, it appeared to kind of not be as bad up in the walls. So we re redid all the plumbing on the basement and then we had all the tying into the lines that were feeding the second floor and first floor. And I think you helped me with it. It probably took us the better part of four or five hours to do it. And we charged the lines back up and the client comes down and she's like, well, it seems like all my sinks are, the water flow is really slow. So I went upstairs and yeah, I didn't end up replumbing. I ended up 
having to pull the screens out of every faucet in the entire house. And they were all very dated. So I couldn't just run down to the local plumbing supply store and pick up the wrenches. Um, we got really creative. I had some mini needle nose trying to get them out. But just in that, yeah, I'd say four or five hours, the amount of calcium that was in these screens was, I was, it blew me away. I wish I would have had the thought to take pictures of it. At that point, I was just really frustrated and uh, it was well after working hours when we finished. Um, but these are things to take into consideration. So now we kind of will talk about that before we do anything major because uh, this was probably a 75 year old house. So you're kind of at that, that age where you can have issues like that. If you want to protect yourself from liability, you definitely want to explain to your clients that the systems that you're working on are the systems that you're liable for. The, mm -hmm. the impacts to the other part of the house, in an ideal world, we would have been able to bill for that time because you basically rebuilt three of their faucets. Uh, or I think even, I thought we had to replace one, but whatever the case, you're, you're exposing yourself to liability when you work on the plumbing system because their expectation is, hey, you know, you worked on it here and now I have a problem here. That's your problem. Well, that's true, but I didn't put the calcium in the line and there's really not any way that I could have mitigated that other than to go around before we turn the water back on and remove all the screens and all the plumbing fixtures in the house, which isn't really the best choice, especially in a shower valve assembly where you could potentially, I'm going to break the tile off trying to get this caulked on uh, yeah. cover. And, you know, that's just not a, a fair thing to do. We've We've had clients before that, you know, oh, we tiled the entryway and now your door, the doorbell doesn't work. Like, well, okay, I, I was working in the entryway, but I'm not sure that I could be liable for the doorbell not working as a function of my tile work. So these are things that you just kind of want to be mindful of as you're working through a project with a client. Let them know I can maintain the quality of my work, but I can't be liable for the entire house around me when I'm not working on the entire house. Let's be reasonable and have that conversation be ongoing so that everyone has reasonable expectations. Um, you, know, you know, you guys said at the beginning about how... Uh, it it takes takes years of experience to be able to anticipate all of the problems that you that you see in a house like this. And uh, one thing you were talking about the gas lines earlier that were obviously defunct. Uh, one thing I've seen come up in the in the news a couple of times in recent years is people who assumed gas lines were intact and then went and connected something to them, not realizing that someone had cut a line further down the line. So you always have to do your due diligence to inspect the existing conditions as much as you can. But uh, there's some scary situations out there if you're not careful. Yeah. It, there's no substitute for experience, but certainly there are a lot of resources, Doug's articles, all, all the stuff that we've found on the website uh, and obviously in the magazine over the years. There, there's a lot of leadership out there and uh, you're not walking in blind, but you can certainly walk in better prepared if you've uh, done a fair bit of reading and uh, and talking to your talking to your peers in the industry. That's how we ended up with a, a pretty good strategy on structural analysis. Um, going all the way back to the initial project uh, meeting, when Joe and I are walking through a job, we're identifying walls that are different. Uh, when they're talking about, well, we really want to open up this kitchen, you're like, well, great, but do you notice how this cased opening is eight inches thick? Like this, this one by eight is concealing a stack that's behind this wall. So yes, I understand you want to take out this wall and open up the space, but we are going to have to reroute this plumbing. And you get the, well, how do you know there's plumbing in there? And well, this is how I know. There's no reason for this wall to be thick unless the stack is in here. And also, if you didn't notice, this side of the case to opening is six feet wide and this side's only three feet wide. I'll bet you a dollar there's a, a trunk line running HVAC to the second floor through there. So we need to plan for those sorts of changes uh, with really at that point, it, it needs to be a, a properly designed uh, set of plans. Usually it involves Joe and I headed to the basement to see if we can track down all of these utilities and mechanicals that are running through the space. And then we can make the assessment of, okay, we can bring in an engineer. They can design a beam to locate in this, put, uh, in this place so that we can open up this wall and we have an access point to bring the stack up over here or we can re relocate this uh, this ductwork, and that's that's one of the things that we we certainly want to be ahead of when we're pricing the job, uh, because you never want to promise something that you can't deliver. Um, this is something you can never plan for, 
the 16 different people touched it before I got here problem. This is a, an image from a kitchen we did just this last year that involved what I have to assume is at least four different iterations of a bathroom remodel. And the initial bathtub installation required cutting out what had to be 80% of the truss of the joists that were supporting that tub and mud bed tile floor. And so each successive person that approached the project included their new solution. Uh, some of which were the two by sixes that you can see the washers and, and lag bolts uh, trying to support that. There's a, a, a mending plate from uh, the truss building world. There's some, some perpendicular bracing that was, I think intended to sort of bridge things down. And then you can see we've tacked up some two by four blocking to that existing system so that we could level it all off and begin our drywall. But the terrifying thing is that that cast iron tub that you're seeing the drain line for above was essentially unsupported. No sheathing of the floor underneath it. So the four feet in the cast iron tub were all airborne, just you know, free floating. So the only thing that was holding that up was the tile floor on the lip side of the tub and then the ledger on the back wall behind it. And that's the kind of thing that you're you're probably seeing again and again if you're looking at houses that are 100 years old like we are in our market. This one actually probably closer to 120 years old. They just didn't have the level of code enforcement uh, and frankly knowledge. That I wouldn't say they were doing anything wrong. They were doing what they thought was right. They didn't know better. They didn't know that if you cut out the top third of a joist right in the center, it's going to deflect and maybe fail uh, and loading it up with a giant pile of mortar bed and tile, and then maybe a 250 pound cast iron bathtub that you're going to put another, well, I don't know, 400 pounds of water in person into is probably not a good path to a stable structural situation. So these things have to be addressed, regardless of whether it was part of your scope or not. You cannot leave it when you unearth it without the attention that it requires. And you can see there, obviously we added some LVL to uh, support that tub. And then we blocked up to the back side of the tub and then did the same thing on the opposite side of the joist that you can't see. That was a lot of bracing, but it was what had to be done in order to keep that safe. Because once you pull the plaster down and expose it, that's your baby. Yeah, on this project, uh, God, that brings back some memories, Travis. <laughs> so not only was the tub not supported, after we removed the ceiling, our guys were working in the space and um, the client was taking a shower and water was literally dripping onto the floor in the kitchen space. And we determined that the tile was just not sealed. Like it, there was just missing grout. Um, the whole bathroom was not done correctly. Uh, you can see the trap and the drain line for the tub. It makes its way all the way to the stack. It had an inch and a half of reverse fall. So the tub would have to fill up before the pipe. It would even push the water into the drain. So we ended up uh, resealing the tub and made sure it was waterproof. And then out of just Travis and I, their budget was pretty tight for the kitchen project. Um, out of our generosity, we went ahead and replumbed that whole tub in uh, their bathroom sink and did it correctly. Ended up having to reroute it. Um, probably we probably dedicated a day's worth of labor to it and they're like oh well this is how it's supposed to drain I was like yeah it's not supposed to fill up and I don't even know how it, it, it drained enough that the water would sit in the pipe so it wasn't actually in the tub but I'm still a little perplexed that it wasn't constantly two inches of water in that tub so just to reiterate we do like to be generous. We like to make sure that our clients are leaving satisfied, but this is a situation where we, I don't feel like we had a choice. Like once, yeah. once you touch it, your client's expectation is that it's, it's not going to get worse. And the only way that we could protect ourselves from callbacks is to address this because frankly, we cover it back up. We're just kicking the can down the road. Someone's going to have to rip that ceiling out and replumb that at some point. Well, and we're that's putting, not yeah, we're putting in, um, almost a six figure kitchen. And so it protects us that we're not ripping out the ceiling of our brand new kitchen to fix a plumbing leak that we knew about. So at this point, we're, we're kind of 
once we've exposed these issues, if there's something that's beyond our expertise that we can't confidently say this is going to hold up, then we're going to bring in an engineer. And you saw the LVL in the last image. A lot of times your lumberyard will help you to size that. Uh, you know, the the folks at Weyerhaeuser and and LP and all, or excuse me, Georgia Pacific and all the all the different lumber suppliers, they tend to have that level of service for you. You can you can certainly talk to your structural engineer that you work with regularly, uh, which is what we had to do in this image here. You can see we're basically we're doing that classic, hey, we want open concept. Uh, we're going to take out all the walls and install this giant metal beam. Well, I can't size steel and stamp it. So let's go ahead and get a structural engineer involved. And that's something you need to know your own limitations and you need to be compliant with your local authorities, because if you don't, you are 100 percent liable when the project doesn't go the way that it should to deliver to your client. So uh, bringing in a steel beam is something that uh, fine home building has you know, done a number of articles about over the years. Uh, as far as removing walls and combining spaces. So you can refer to those authorities. But generally speaking, our process is you leave the walls in that you can until you have to start cutting out a uh, structural load path. And then you're building temp walls to support either side. You raise the beam into place. Be smart about this, folks. Don't be a hero. Nobody needs to have back surgery. Uh, we've all lifted beams into place that we really shouldn't have ever carried. When we started renting beam lifts, it was one of the smartest things uh, and we always, of course, say, oh, we should have always done it this way. So take care of your people. Uh, they're your most valuable resource for sure. In terms of getting through the finishes, which was the next step here, this is something that I think people, uh, they want to rush through. You know, you've been on the job a long time. The client's ready for you to be gone. They don't want to invest any more in the project. They're over budget. They're, they're tired of you being in their space. This is not the time to speed up. This is the time to slow down and really get it right. You can see the, I'm, this is obviously I'm removing a fixture that uh, <laughs> has lived its useful life, but you can see how much care was taken to work within the space. We've got a uh, canvas protecting the ends of the rubber boots that are on the ladder, you know, the little rubber end boots, because they've been outside and so they're dirty and I don't want to clean and repaint the wall. I don't want to risk, you know, one of them sticking to the wall and popping off and knocking all the pictures family off the wall. So we've we've protected that end. We've got canvas over the railings so that we can put the plank in place. All these things that you you've got to take the time to make sure that the things you've installed for your client are being delivered in the as new condition that they're expecting. And you also have to continue to protect the remainder of the job around you. So even as we're we're showing obviously floor protection here as well. This is earlier in the project. But that level of care that was taken here with the, uh, I guess that's X board, it's a RAM board similar, um, that level of care isn't just for the rough stages. You have to keep that level of, um, I don't want to say panic, but it's certainly concern. You want to be concerned from start to finish because if you stub your toe on the way out the door, that's all they'll remember. They don't yeah. think about the great job that you did keeping their house safe for eight months or six months or however long the project was. And all the care that you took to make sure that dust didn't get into their kids' room, they will only remember that one stupid glob of mud that your guy dropped on the rug, or you know your your tile setter as he's grouting goes out and dumps the grout bucket in the front landscaping. That's what they remember. So you have to maintain that level of vigilance for the entire duration of the project. Yeah, and this one here, we're kind of the dark gray wall. We're trying to. Uh bring our wall up to it yeah that's one of travis's signature doors there um and on the remodeling side especially on these older houses we're using adhesives every time we're putting up our drywall when we set that giant beam we were packing that beam out we're putting in like a a lock type type or a you know any kind of Real just premium yeah good construction adhesive and I mean, we want that satisfying moosh where we're getting a little bit of squeeze out. Um, is you know our mentality, and like even here on our corners, all everything's glued. Um, you know, if you just take the time to take that little extra step, uh, Travis and I have this joke. It's like the worst thing to do would be have to tear out our own work because it's always overbuilt. <laughs> um, and to your point about the details on the end, it is, it's all about the fit and finish is what we call it. It's, we want to make sure our under cabinet lighting is 
perfectly straight that we don't have any wires hanging down that our tile lines up especially if we have like a mosaic on the backsplash um it's just every little detail because you know you can start off the project great but if you don't end it on a positive note then it's just kind of a sour taste and um and travis and i hate doing warranty so our we're always striving to deliver this perfect product. And then the next time we see our clients, we kind of work in the same community. We'll literally run into them at coffee shops, at the grocery store. Um, we want it to be, hey, how's the project? They're like, it's great. It's the best space in our house. We're going to be talking to you about the next one here next year. And that's what we're always striving for. And it's, you know, you can call it OCD. You can call it all sorts of things, but that's how we run it. Yeah, I think that uh, the the level of care to keep, you know, the the dust from migrating to other rooms, in this case, uh, keeping the tile, as we're about to do this entire wall, uh, keeping that wet saw cast off from going anywhere other than the workspace, uh, it shows a level of respect and care that our clients certainly expect. And frankly, it's not that hard to do. I mean, this is what, maybe $40 in, in PVC fittings, and then the level of time and investment in plastic. It, it's frankly a pretty low bar to clear to differentiate yourself from your competition potentially. But really, like Joe said, it's it's to reduce your liability and your potential callbacks. Uh, it's the same as screwing down a floor or, you know, in our case, um, a lot of these homes have limited access, but usually we have unfinished basements in our market. And we can, we can visit from the underside of floors, uh, or even if we're tearing out a ceiling, we can address second floors rather than uh, plugging and screwing down the hardwoods in the upstairs and really changing the look of things. We can, we can introduce a, a, a toe screwed approach through the joists with some, some PL premium or other uh, high quality sealant, uh, excuse me, adhesive to really lock those things down. And then you're providing not just the, the care for the finished appearance, but you're also improving because we had access to it, why wouldn't we fix that? You're you're providing a better experience for the client long term, and that's going to give you the the opportunity to continue to work in in these neighborhoods again and again because of the client referrals. So I think that pretty well shoots through the process from start to finish. Uh, if there are questions, I think this would be a good time to approach them. But uh, if you if you have other things you wanted to cover, Robert Joe, I'm not I'm not trying to run the show. I just I feel like we we hit the outline, and I don't want to take people's time all night. Yeah, no, I, I I think you guys got through the whole process based on the outline that you were that you shared with me. Um, so we're we're getting on in time here. So maybe we should jump in on some of the questions. Let's do it. Um, so uh, Peter asked, uh, how do you do your as-built measurements on a job site? That's great. Uh, one of my least favorite things is opening a set of plans and say contractor to field verify all dimensions. I'm like, oh man, that's pretty rough. I, I feel like if if we can't measure, we can't design. Uh, <laughs> but I will yeah. say that the way that we handle uh, all of those measurements tend to be taken multiple times. We're we're going to go ahead and check the the plan if there was one provided against what we see in the field. If we're making a a, a variation from that or you know a deviation from that, I should say, then we're we're certainly clearing that with the client. I'm not sure I'm answering his question accurately in terms of as-built dimensions. If if it's a, a situation where we're we're going to change load path, then we have to obviously get our structural engineer back involved. And we have had that happen a number of times where they thought that, you know, you know the roof the roof is bearing here, and so we're going to have to add this triple joist to pick up that load. And we have had them back out to say, hey, you know, we've we've unearthed huh, the reality of the situation and. We actually have load path running the other way for whatever reason they change the joist directions. And so uh, that's something that we would certainly always want to bring in the design professional if it's going to change uh, on, a, on a permitted project where the engineer has liability, they've stamped a set of drawings. That's something that's very important to be respectful of your design professionals and involve them uh, in that way. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, before we jump to the next question, I just want to remind people, just in case people are leaving before the Q&A is over, that this presentation has been recorded and that we will be able to put it on the website in a couple of days at finehomebuilding.com slash webinars. And that's again, where you will also uh, check in regularly to see what other upcoming presentations are coming. So 
Um, Michael asked, when taping floor protection and dust protection uh, to floor and wall surfaces, um, are you concerned with the adhesive of the tape uh, damaging any uh, existing surfaces? That can definitely be a concern. Um, what we'll do is we'll make sure all the surfaces are clean first, clean, dry, and then we'll typically use like a scotch uh, or a 3M blue tape. Uh, with the 30 day clean. And it's pretty rare that we've ever had to go back with like goof off or anything and kind of get the, the adhesive off. Um, and yeah, so if we're taping off something a little bit more valuable, another thing we do is we tell the clients if it's uh, a remodel within their house, hey, if you have anything on your walls or anything that's very precious to you, let's go ahead and box that up now and not leave it up. Um, I don't think we've had as much issue with the floor finish, uh, as far as we tend to have older polyurethane, uh, yeah. finished floors. So the delamination risk is actually less there on newer homes where they've already been refinished, uh, especially a waterborne finish. I think we've, uh, been a little bit more, uh, careful. We like the G tape products. They're, yeah. uh, they're, they're more useful in those, uh, more risky situations, but we have had a number of projects where we, we taped plastic to a, a wall or trim finish. Usually it's trim that wasn't prepped well. And of course, now we're repainting the trims because the adhesive of the tape is stronger than the adhesive bond between the primer and the paint uh, because of a lack of preparation in the, the paint from way back when. So it is important to be mindful of that. And using a, a lower adhesion tape for that base taping is a, a good strategy for that. We have found, particularly with RAM board and the thicker floor protections that have a memory, if you don't use a higher adhesion tape on the base taping, because as I said, we, we basically tape, the, we clean the whole floor, uh, wiping it down at the edge, and then we tape it with just a wide two inch or at least inch and a half blue tape, like Joe's saying. Then we lay out our floor protection and we're taping the floor protection to the tape. That allows us to be very detailed in the application of that perimeter protection and get a really nice wide surface area of bonding. And then we can be sloppy and fast as we're taping our floor protection down. But those boards that have a memory like RAM board that wanna come up, we, we will overcome the low adhesion tapes and undo our fine work. So we tend to use the higher adhesion tapes in those applications. Okay. Um, Andy was asking, uh, how do you feel about homeowners wanting to uh, be involved in any of the process, like his particularly demolition he's talking about. Oh, you want to tell the Peretta story? <laughs> yeah, we had a homeowner that uh, he's like, I'm going to demo this whole house myself. Demo we were party. basically keeping a couple of the exterior walls and more or less just rebuilding the whole house, putting a second floor on it. So they had a demo party. It was supposed to be on a Saturday. I think it started at nine. By 11 o'clock, he was he was in the ER, um, stitches and all. And then he recovered from that. And he was just a real active guy. And he's like, I'm going to demo all the tile in the entryway. Well, we're sitting there and we're working. We're like pouring foundations. And we look over and he's just going to town with a sledgehammer. And he ended up breaking the subfloor, damaging the joists. It's like, yeah, you caused probably double the amount of work by saving by doing this and um his wife was like just kind of like whatever just let them have that and we'll pay to fix it um i think yeah to answer your question that would be a kind of a case-by-case -case assessment we if we're going to let our clients do anything um we're like you can paint it yourself but that also includes the prep um if they want to take time and provide we'll kind of give them an outline of like, okay, these are the shower valves we recommend. And if they want to go do their shopping, we can, they can save money that way because we're not charging them our time to pick up their products. They can deliver their own tile. Um, so we try to find ways like that, that is a little bit, they're still involved, but they're doing less critical work. Yeah. I think that's a good way to say that, Joe. We, we have frequently had clients that say, well, we can't quite make budget. Is there anything that we could do from the scope that would save us money? And we used to let clients do more to try and cooperate with that. But um, 
they would tend to be dissatisfied with their own finished outcome. Like we would have clients that wanted to paint, like almost everyone has, you know, painted their dorm room in college or whatever it was. People feel like they can paint and a lot of them can, but many of them don't understand the amount of prep that goes into a quality paint job. So on a renovation, maybe a basement finish or something like, Hey, let me paint the basement bedrooms. We're, we're probably going to let them do that. It's their house. And if they want that level of finish, we're willing to accommodate that. But for things that we are liable for, obviously, because we're licensed in all the trades, it's all on our permits. We don't let clients do their own electrical, plumbing, HVAC, uh, certainly not structure. Obviously, Joe told the demolition story. There's a very limited amount of things that we think it's a good idea for the client to do themselves. But a lot of our clients are professionals. Uh, we tend to work for a lot of architects and engineers. Certainly, they're working on their own projects. And that's a, a successful path. Uh, landscaping, things that we're not really adding value to if the homeowner wants to take that on. Perfect. Yeah. Please do. Uh, save your big. budget. Uh, real quick, uh, one of our first jobs, Travis and I did, we did a primary suite and it was beautiful. I mean, Carrera marble, um, you know, tile everywhere, custom closet, custom cabinets. And the client, she did do an excellent job painting it. She painted it herself, but we came back after you know, it was hot pink, and that <laughs> was the kind of pictures. It was like, yeah, oh, it was, no. <laughs> it was something else. But, but she, she was it. happy. She was happy. Yeah. Um, David makes a distinction. He thinks there should be a distinction between the term demolition and deconstruction, and comments that deconstruction is probably what really is appropriate when you're doing a remodel. Yes, I would agree. I think that uh, there are actually some really skilled. Uh, subcontractors that do this type of work. I think there was one on uh, either a pro talk or uh, maybe featured in the regular uh, fine home building podcast. Uh, and even in articles, I think there's been a couple. Yeah. Asa but... Christiana wrote an article on, uh, on smart demolition and it was based somewhere in the Northwest, a company that actually, I might even be in like a municipal service or I don't know what it was. It was something where they actually have a, a process, a very specific process of the, the whole recycling, you know, stream of materials going directly to the the reuse, uh, you know, people who will be reusing them and everything. Yeah, that's a really good distinction. Um, so someone asked how much time are you investing in prospects prior to signing for an agreement? That's a great uh, question. You want to ha handle that, Joe? Um, sometimes we might talk to a client for a year, um, you know, we'll meet with them before they really have a design. We'll kind of give them a general outline of what we're thinking. Sometimes we'll, you know, maybe spend an hour and give them a rough budget and then tell them to go and we'll give them names of architects, um, on a larger project. That's usually the process. Um, I'd say on your typical bathroom remodel that doesn't require plans or kitchen remodel that's within the footprint, um, it could be, you know, our courtship might be a month and then we're typically booked out. Uh, depending, it could be anywhere four to six months up to a year and a half. Um, and so we'll just say, you know, uh, we'll go ahead and sign a contract and we'll put you in line and kind of give them a, a ballpark of what we think the schedule is and then give them updates as we get closer. The, uh, the book that I always reference that I think was very formative to the way that we started catalyst is, uh, David Gerstel's, uh, burger cell. I, I've never met David, so I, I might be mispronouncing his last name, but it's, uh, I think it's called running a small construction company. And he, that's where I was first introduced to the idea of cost planning services. I know Fernando has written a number of pieces about how to, properly charge for your time when you're looking at projects. Um, the cost planning services model serves us well on larger projects where we're going to be investing. You know, Joe might have 40 to 50 hours in pricing uh, a large set of new home plans or even a, a very involved renovation for a whole house renovation. It could be in that realm. And that's not an appropriate amount of investment at uh, the, the free bid. Uh, but to your point, Joe, it's very common for us to do Hey, this is our initial meeting. Let's meet each other. See if this is a project that makes sense for our firm. See if you'll like us. Uh, see if we like you. Does this make sense? Is it the timeline going to apply? All those things. A lot of that we do with an online 
form before we even met. And then we reinforce that with the personality uh, in person. And at that time, it's very common for us to say, it's going to be a ballpark figure that we're going to provide you in an email. And if it makes sense for you to proceed with design, then we can provide a legitimate scope of work and proposal based on that design. But a ballpark is something that's more attainable for a much smaller amount of time invested. Yeah. Right. So we're uh, we're a bit a bit past seven. I'm going to ask one more question. I think then we're going to wrap it up. Um, Michael asked, uh, he knows you both are big proponents of green building and building science and construction waste just seems uh, like a huge problem in our industry. And do you see any positive movement in this area and um, uh, how and how you effectively manage your waste? I think we do, I would say we're opportunistic in that because yeah, our work is inherently uh, wasteful. Uh, it's one of the things that uh, I love Martin Holiday for a number of reasons, but uh, his, his quotes about if you're cold, put on a sweater, don't replace your windows uh, are kind of a guiding principle in our approach to things. We often tell clients that there are things that don't necessarily require a replacement unless it's an aesthetic choice. We try to avoid those things. Uh, I I feel pretty strongly that we're doing the most that we can uh, to serve our clients in terms of providing durable assemblies. That's our, our most important path to sustainability yeah. as a company is providing extremely durable assemblies. Things that will not have to be replaced is the best path to sustainability for us because frankly, our clients uh, are are not usually just talking to us. We've had a few that came to us and said, you're our guys, whatever you think, we'll just do it. And you're, you're going to you have a blank check. But I think those are rare for most, most firms. And they certainly are for us. Most of our clients are going to talk to two or three other uh, contractors uh, about their project. And if we're saying, you know, we're going to go ahead and figure out a way to do this without any concrete, we're going to go ahead and source uh, locally milled lumber for all of this. Th those are premium services a lot of the time. Sometimes you can do it for less, but oftentimes not. So when we're faced with that, we are trying to work within a system uh, that we're, the market that we're in, uh, as well as the systems that are available to us. And so renewable resources are a priority, but never, uh, never to our client's detriment. I would always rather put up, you know, a, oh, we're going to do an addition. Well, we're going to go ahead and use zip system on that with our standard air sealing detail from foundation to sill uh, across the roof. Because if they redo the rest of the house on the next renovation, I want them to be able to tie into a perfect air control layer and properly managed water. And frankly, that's why what Joe said earlier about, hey, this is the most comfortable room in the house. We really love seeing you at the, at the bar. It, it was great working with you guys. And I got to tell you, the project was great. It's because of that level of planning that, hey, this isn't going to be their last renovation. The, the right view, in my, in my opinion, for renovation work is that we're never the last ones there. There's always going to be a future for that family in that space. And our responsibility is to do the best with what we get to touch so that when they do the rest, and hopefully with us, but if not, someone's going to be able to tie into a good system and not have to keep throwing things away every time there's a style change. We want to choose timeless finishes that the client likes if they give us that input, but ultimately it really is a, it's a, it's a service industry and we have to, we have to do what the client is wanting done to their home. We just do it our way. And that usually involves materials that are going to remain very durable and provide service for a very long time. Well, I think that's actually a, a perfect way to wrap up this uh, conversation, Travis. So I'm glad we had that com that question last. And uh, I want to thank you guys for a great talk, a great insight into the way you're, you take care of business, because I know you guys do such a wonderful job. So uh, I, I know you're an inspiration for, for a lot of other people who are trying to do good work, too. Well, there's a lot of great folks out there doing stuff that have inspired us. And it's been a real pleasure to uh, kind of grow up in the trades, read and find home building, and to now be a, a part of giving back to that community is, is a real pleasure. So thanks for the opportunity, Rob. Yeah, great. thank you, Rob. Okay, and uh, again, I'd like to thank Loctite PL Max for sponsoring tonight's talk and remind everyone before we go, again, go ahead and take a look at 
findhumbling.com slash webinars in a couple of days, and you'll find a recording of tonight's presentation. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Take care. Again. Have a great night.